Hello friends. Today we're going to talk about what the difference is between good fear and bad fear. Okay. And this is inspired by, well, the Bible, but also about just kind of this question between that I find a lot of people ask that I've asked of, is there a difference? Is, is there a difference between a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear? Or is fear always bad? Or is fear good? Like there's, there's some confusion around fear. And so we're going to talk about that today and discover the, t the difference. Like there actually is a good kind of fear and a bad kind of fear. And we're going to talk about what the difference is between these two kinds of fear because we should have one of them all the time. And there's one that we should never or very rarely experience. All right. So we're going to talk about that today. Before we dive in, let me pray over you today and please just join me really quick. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to share what you have taught me about, about fear, Lord, about how um, there's a good kind and there's a bad kind and that sometimes we are so uh, zealous in our fighting and trying to eradicate the bad kind of fear that in the process we also lose the good fear and the healthy fear. So Lord, I just pray that um, as I share what you've taught me in this, that it would bless those who are listening, Lord. I just pray for each person who is um, reached by the sound of my voice, whether it's right now or um, on the replay, Lord. I just, I thank you for each and every person who's taking the time to to learn this as well, to learn about what it means to fear you um, and what it means to fear evil things, Lord. So I just pray for um, open hearts and minds, Lord, and I pray for just a filter over my mouth that only that is which from you would be um, spoken, Lord, that you would stop anything that is untrue or anything that is not of you from, from coming out, Lord. I thank you, Father, and I just lift this time up to you in your name. Amen. All right, friends. So there are two kinds of fear. All right, there are. And I'm, I'm going to start with a passage. This is the passage that um, the Lord used to really get me on this kind of journey of learning about this. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start at the beginning with you guys. All right. So Exodus 20, 20 um, says, do not be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come down in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. All right, so some context really quick is the Lord had just come down from heaven to give Moses the Ten Commandments and he came down like thunder and lightning and he was revealing himself to all of Israel, not just Moses. He revealed himself to everyone. And the Israelites freaked out and were like, we don't want to go before God. You, Moses, you go. You go and talk to him for us and then tell us what he says. So this is really interesting because, first of all, God initially was going to tell everybody the things. But because the Israelites were afraid, they didn't want to hear from him themselves. They wanted Moses to go hear, listen from to God and then tell them what God said. Um... But what's really interesting with this verse specifically is instead of instead of condemning their fear and saying, don't be afraid, like, let, go listen to God, let God talk to you, right? Come up on the mountain with me or, or let's have the Lord talk to us. Moses says, don't be afraid for God has come down in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. So... This really clearly shows that there's two types of fear that, and that one of them is good. Okay. So let's, we're going to talk about one, the bad kind of fear, and I'm going to not spend a ton of time on that. I'm just going to kind of highlight what it is. And then we're going to spend a little more time talking about the good kind of fear, because honestly, I've done several videos on the bad kind of fear and, and you can go watch those if you want to. <laughs> so, um, the first type of fear, don't be afraid. Okay. So, um, when Moses is saying, don't be afraid, right? Because it almost seems like when we look at the verse, don't be afraid for God has come down in this way and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. That almost seems like a kind of contradiction because it's don't be afraid, but then the fear of God is good. So what what's going on here? Well, here's what's going on. The Israelites were afraid for their life and for their overall well-being, like their physical well-being. 
Um, and see, the physical um, carnal fear, I guess we could call it, carnal earthly fear, this is the fear that we should be fighting. This is the bad fear. This is the fear that says, what if I don't have enough money to pay my bills? What if I get hurt? What if I get sick? What if my kid gets hurt? What if my kid gets sick? What if my husband loses his job? What if, all the what ifs, okay? The what ifs, those kind of fears. Um, and honestly, um, that's something that we deal with a lot in the world, right? The, it seems like the world is just ruled by fear often. That that is something that really controls a lot of people. And so, um, especially at the time of filming this right now, where it's, Right now, as I'm filming it, it's August 2020, and we are still in the midst of dealing with the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And it's really interesting to just kind of be watching because people are so afraid, and it's and it's causing them to do some pretty crazy things. And you know, and that's just one example. But we can look at the Bible, we can look at just history, and see how fear the carnal earthly fear of being afraid for your life or being afraid for, you know, bad things happening causes people to do some really not smart things. So that's the fear that's the bad kind of fear. We should not be living in a state of fear and panic and stress in that sense. That type of fear indicates a lack of trust in God and a lack of, of understanding of his sovereignty. And, and, and again, just trust in his sovereignty and in God that he wants what's best for us and that he is working everything out that is good for us, right? Romans 8, 28 says that, um, for we know that all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. For, so if you're a Christian, if you have accepted Christ and you are following God, you've submitted your life to him and you are seeking after him, you should not be living in, in this kind of fear, in the, in the earthly fear. Because you know that no matter what happens, even if your husband loses his job, even if you can't pay the bill, even if you get sick or your kid gets sick or your family member gets sick, even if someone dies, you know that this earth is not your home and that everything that happens here on earth is God is using to work out for your ultimate good. Because here's the deal, guys. The ultimate good is being with Jesus. I think we tend to lose sight of that sometimes. The ultimate good is being with Jesus. So even if like all hell breaks loose here on earth, which we know is going to in the end times, by the way, like it's going to like literally earth is going to become hell for like hell on earth for a season in the end times. We're not there yet. Okay. This is just the birth pangs, but the ultimate good is for, uh, for us is Jesus is being with God, being with Jesus. And here's the deal. Therefore, we know that even if we die, even if our physical bodies die, it's only good because we're going to be with God right away. We're just going to go to Jesus, go be with Jesus. So there's no need for this carnal fear. And this for Christians, this carnal fear comes in when we lose sight of who God is and what our role is with him. And, and we lose sight of trusting him ultimately. So that's type one. Okay, this is that's the bad kind of fear, basically. If you want to label it, that's a bad kind of fear. It's the living in a state of fear and stress and worry and concern. And it it's hallmarked by just total lack of peace and stress and often illness because stress, constant stress and worry lead to illness. So that's the bad kind of fear. Okay, but then there's another kind of fear. This is type, I'm calling it type two, but it's the good kind of fear. And this is the fear of the Lord, okay? And this type of fear is talked about a lot in the Bible, okay? So for example, Proverbs 9, 10 says that, like chapter nine, verse 10, says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or knowledge. This kind of fear is healthy, okay? Because here's the deal, right? Looking back to our beginning verse, Exodus 20, 20, um, and the context that God had come down to speak to the Israelites in thunder and lightning, right? And Moses says that God has come down in this way to test you so that you're, and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. A fear of the Lord is healthy because it is some, it helps to keep us from sinning. Now, I want to 
be really careful about how we talk about this for a minute, though, because the church has, at least some of the churches I've attended, have twisted this idea to make it seem like God is this big, scary, powerful being up in the sky who's just waiting to, like, zing ya for sinning. That's not what's going on, okay? So, because I don't know, okay, I don't know about you guys. You can let me know, like, in the comments if this is what you've experienced. Growing up for me, um, I attended a pretty conservative church and then I went to a very conservative Bible college. And uh, between the church and the college, um, ha had a very unhealthy view of God because the way that the church, and I will say like my parents didn't teach me this. My parents were, worked very hard to teach me like that God's loving and like has a, a loving relationship with us, but unfortunately the, the voice of the church and some extended family members who did not have my parents' view but had a more fear of the Lord, God's going to smite you, hell and damnation <laughs> view of God, um, those voices just for me were a lot louder. And so even though my parents tried to teach me a healthier view, the church didn't. <laughs> and the Bible college I attended didn't as well. And so Anyway, but for, so for me growing up, some of the more loud voices in my life that were t taught me about God taught me, you know, that he is angry and wants to, and is like waiting to punish you. And that like, if you sin like that, you could lose your salvation over that. Like that basically like if you sin, it means you weren't actually saved. Like there's, don't even get me started, honestly, because um, it's so wrong. It's so wrong. I had such a wrong view of God for so much of my life, and it caused so much pain and heartache, and honestly, it led to depression and self-harming and anxiety and a whole host of a mess of things that the Lord, praise the Lord, he's healed me from. I'm no longer there, but that's how dark it got because of a wrong view of God, because unfortunately... Some denominations and, and churches teach that that view of God, like the that only like just that God is, you know, God is sovereign, which he is, but that he is, they don't show him as loving, I guess, right? And so I want to be careful about how we talk about this because the fear of the Lord is important because here's the, here's the deal. God is sovereign. Okay. God is sovereign. He is beyond us. He is all powerful. He has the ability. Here is the deal. He has the ability to smite us where we stand. He does. He is capable of doing that. Okay. Just because he's capable doesn't mean he's going to or that he even wants to. Okay. And so that's, I really want to highlight that for you guys. Cause if any of you are, any of my viewers who are like me were raised in a church that really, really, really focused on the whole smiting ability of God. Um, there might be a lot of unhealthy fear of the Lord. Like he's going to punish you and that you're scared of him in an unhealthy way. And I really want to help you understand that it's, it's not that kind of fear. It's not the kind of fear of, you know, cowering because you're afraid that he's going to come, you know, beat you. That's not, that's not the kind of father God is. Um, and unfortunately that's, that's the view a lot of, a lot of churches present. So, um, but he has the ability, but he doesn't, he doesn't, right? He doesn't. I've sinned plenty of times, some pretty, I've done some pretty not so great things. And he never once in that immediately like smote me. He convicted me eventually, <laughs> or he, he tried to convict me then. And sometimes I was so hard hearted that I didn't listen, but eventually I was convicted. But here's the deal. Just as coming before like a world leader, for example, would strike nervousness and awe into most people, I would imagine, regardless of what you think of the individual person. Okay. But think about the position and the power that that person holds, whether you agree with them or not the power and position they have. You would probably be kind of nervous if the leader of your country were to invite you for a meeting, 
right? You would want to make sure that you were dressed well. You'd be very respectful. You'd be very um, formal. Um, so just like that, pre the being in the presence of the president or the queen or the emperor or whatever would strike some awe into you, that's the kind of, or even maybe stronger, that kind of awe should be evoked by Almighty God. When we go before all, our God, his presence should evoke reverence and awe and a burning desire to walk in a holy manner. Okay. Because here's the deal. There needs to be a balance. There, we, we need to understand that there's a balance. Okay. In my experience with the church, I told you I was raised in a church that really kind of focused on the whole God, God as, as justice, basically, right? Aspect. And, and I also attended a college that really highlighted that as well to the point where they suppressed the Holy Spirit. Um, on the flip side of that, there's other churches, and I've attended churches like this as well, that teach only God's love. And God is love. He is. But some churches want to focus, and people want to focus just on God as love and leave out his justice. So because here's the deal. God is love. He sent Jesus. Jesus died for us. A gruesome, painful, horrible death. He is love. And he is ready to extend grace and mercy to anyone who comes to him. In a humble, contrite, repentant spirit. And when you do that, he welcomes you in and he floods you with his spirit with his love and you have a relationship with him but here's the deal if you don't for those the people who don't accept christ okay this whole like they're gonna go to hell like they're gonna experience god's wrath this whole idea that all roads lead to heaven is a lie from the pit of hell to for, because Satan is going to hell and he wants to take as many people as he can with him. So he's really worked overtime in the last decades to really get people to believe this idea that all roads lead to heaven. They don't. The Bible says that narrow is the road that leads to heaven and wide is the road that leads to destruction. Okay? The wide road has all the other roads that lead to he like that supposedly lead to heaven. That's not true. The narrow, the narrow, difficult, sometimes painful path is the one that leads to heaven. Now, just because it's hard and sometimes painful doesn't mean it's not so worth it. And that even in the moment, it's there's peace and there's joy and there's God on the journey with you. Here's the deal, friends. We need to understand both elements of God. We need to understand that he is loving and gracious and wants a relationship with us. But we also need to understand that he is holy and just and demands righteousness. It's not an either or. It is a both and. And as Christians walking in that knowledge of both, and if you have a healthy understanding of both, you're kind of double protected from sin. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that the desire to do good comes from relationship, right? Like true heart change. If you, if you are interacting with someone and you love them and you care for them, so much and you find out that something that you do hurts them you will feel so sorry and repentant and you want to change so that you stop hurting them right at least i hope so a healthy a healthy person who has empathy and who truly knows how to who truly loves when they find out that someone that they love is hurt by something that they do or say that the person who hurt the other person, right? You would feel remorse and a desire to change, okay? That comes from relationship, from loving, right? And and also think about too when you're in when you have friends 
who you know love you. You have people in your life who you know that they love you no matter what, and they come to you and say, hey, we're noticing some things about your life that are kind of dangerous, and we, we are concerned for you. You're going to receive that from them and, and apply it to your life, if you're smart, <laughs> because you know that they love you, okay? So heart lasting heart change comes from relationships not fear. And if you're a parent, you know that you hopefully would know this too, that your kid, when you interact with your kids, when they want to please you because they love you and they, and they want a good relationship with you. I mean, they're still kids. They're still sinful. You still have to discipline them eventually, but overall they do, they desire when you have a good relationship with them, they will do everything to maintain that. So God is loving. And he wants that relationship with us. And that relationship with God is where, and that that's the safety of knowing we're loved and accepted in that relationship with God. And the reciprocal love back to him and the gratitude back to him for how he loves us, for the grace he's extended us. That's so important. And, and that's what causes the true heart change. But a healthy understanding of his justice, of his righteousness, of his demand for perfection, that is important as well. Because if we don't realize that we're headed for destruction, how can we be grateful for being saved from that? If you think all roads lead to heaven, well, why bother being a Christian? It's a whole lot easier to go follow some other religion. So the fear of the Lord, when we realize that he is holy, he is just, he demands righteousness, and ultimately he demands perfection. That, and, and knowing that we are not perfect. No siree, we are not perfect. We still sin. Even as Christians, we still sin. Even though part of us is perfect because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, that there's, we'll still make mistakes. That each time we make mistakes, God, when we turn to him and confess our sins and repent, he forgives us. And so that fear, we need to have that healthy fear of God could, he could, he could snipe me where I stand. That's important. But it needs to be balanced with, but I know he won't. So I'm going to show my gratitude for his love and his grace by living a wholly changed life. See, they go together. If you just have the fear of the Lord, you have depression, you have oppression, you have stress, you have fear, you have worry, you have unhealthy fear because it's this constant unsureness about your salvation, unsureness of where you stand. So if you have just the fear of God, that's unhealthy. But if you have just the love and grace aspect of God, that's also unhealthy because you, people so often use it as an excuse to sin and as an excuse to do whatever they want because they got the grace. It's, it's not. Because here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. A Christian life is, is proved by a changed life. If you're a Christian, you should look different from the world. If before you got saved, you were out partying every weekend, drinking a bottle or like drinking a bottle of wine every night to deal with your life and stressing out and yelling at your kids or whatever, or smoking who knows what, or you, you name it, whatever. If before Christ you were doing other things and you accepted Christ, and now you're still doing that, you're still going out and partying on the weekends, you're still living with your boyfriend, you're still yelling at your kids all the time. You need to take a long, hard look at, are you really saved? I'm not saying you're not. I'm not saying you're not saved. But if your life hasn't changed, if you haven't, if you're not on a trajectory of less sin, that you're sinning less today, than you did yesterday. If you're not on a trajectory of understanding just how sinful you are, 
and having a deeper intimacy with God and more obedience towards God than you did last week, you need to take a look, long, hard look at your life and assess, am I really following the Lord? Because following the Lord looks different from the world. We are called to be holy, set apart. And so if you think that accepting Christ means you've got insurance for when you die, you're going to, you know, end up in the right place, but you can still party it up on the, on the earth with whatever else you want to do. That, that's not, that's not a true conversion. That's not a, tr a right or accurate theology. An accurate theology is both is the fear of God, a healthy fear of what that of what our holy God is going to do to a sinful world while also understanding that he has given us a way out of experiencing that punishment because he paid the price because he wants a relationship with us. So friends, This fear of the Lord, it's so important to understand this, okay? Because the wrong type of fear pulls us away from the Lord instead of drawing us closer. I talked about that. An unhealthy view of the fear of the Lord pulls us away from him because we're afraid of him. And we're afraid of relationship because we're afraid of being punished. That's not a healthy, that's, that's not the right kind of fear of the Lord. Because... The real fear of the Lord is based in who he is and should inspire reverence. The fear of the Lord is not like a true shaking in my boots fear. I mean, we did we do see this in the Bible, and there's a pretty good chance we will feel that a little bit. But it's more of a reverence, of an awe, of a wow. Have you ever seen pictures of like a galaxy of the universe? Have you ever seen pictures that make you of of creation that Make you stop and think, wow, I am so small compared to this. If you haven't, I recommend that you go look up some videos of galaxies, videos of the universe, and just see how tiny we are compared to everything God created. That kind of awe is like, I'm so small compared to everything else. That is the kind of like, we should then extend that to God, and God created all of this, which means he's even bigger. So it should inspire reverence, but also that desire for deeper connection and relationship. And that's what I've been talking about, right? The, the, it should inspire this. And there is, there's that desire for more inside of us. There's a desire for, for connection with God. The one who fears the Lord obeys him not because they fear punishment, but because they see his holiness, they see his grace, and they want to please him. Obedience from fear of punishment indicates a lack of relationship and a, a lack of relationship and a, a poor understanding of who God is. If you're obeying, if you, you know, quit cussing because God doesn't like cussing. And you're afraid he's gonna, you know, smite you. That's not, that's not a good reason, honestly. If you're, but if you stopped cussing because you realize that the Lord, it hurts the Lord's ears. It's painful to hear when he hears his children using foul and disgusting language. And so you stopped cussing because of that. Well, that's a good reason because it's from it stems from relationship. Do you guys see that? Like the act is the same, right? The, the behavior is the same, but it's all about the motivation. God really ultimately, he cares about the motivation, the heart behind it far more than what you're actually doing. Like literally guys, I'm going to, I can do a whole nother video on that. I'm gonna have to do a whole nother video on that because that's a whole nother topic. But what I want to really, really highlight right now is the person who fears the Lord obeys him not because they fear punishment, but because they see his holiness and they want to please him. Obedience from fear of punishment indicates a lack of relationship and full understanding of God. That is so important. So what do we do? This is what I challenge you to do, guys. I really, I challenge you to sit down and take a long, hard look at your life and pray, 
and ask the Lord to show you and give you discernment to see the difference between holy and unholy fear in your life. Ask him to reveal to you where you need to develop a healthy fear of him and where you need to fight fear and what, where you need to eradicate the unholy fear. It's hard work, but it's so worth it because when you have the, a a healthy, accurate understanding of God, oh guys, it's so worth it. The relationship with God, it's, it's amazing. So when you are able to see and walk in that balance, between the fear of God and his love and a relationship with him, mm, that is where the good life comes in. It is peaceful. Even if everything is falling apart around you, even if the world is going crazy, even if your circumstances look like everything's going wrong, but you're walking in that relationship with God, life is so good because you know he's got you and you can just walk and following him. And mm, man, you will be so blessed and so full of joy and peace. And that is what I want for you, friends. So do that. I really, I encourage you and I challenge you, do that today. Pray, ask the Lord for discernment to know the difference and to start walking in the difference. And you are going to have an amazing life. All right. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, if you found it encouraging, um, convicting, if you found it even like a kick in the pants, please leave me a comment sharing what you thought of it, as well as share it with your friends so that they can also be encouraged. All right. Have a beautiful day, my friends. Goodbye.